Record is rolling. My name is Lonnie Ray. I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee today, and I am a writer. Um, I love facilitating messages and angles that expand my clients' market reach further than they thought by two or 300%. Um, I'm a nine-time show host, podcaster, podcast guest trainer, uh, a two-time number one international best-selling author. Thanks, Steve. And um, I'm delighted that uh, we were, we'll be working on a new project where um, we invite people to, to share a unique perspective shift that they've gone through over the last five years in a book that we called Rattled Awake. And I'm super excited. Thanks. All right. That's awesome. Thanks, Lonnie. My name is Steve Kidd. I am a third generation minister and international bestselling author of 21 books and counting. I actually have five other really cool ones that I've, that I'm working on. In fact, two of them are, are written now. They're just being edited. Um, lots of cool stuff going on, but today we want to focus on you. We want to help you write your book. We want to help you get it done. We're going to spend this time writing your bestseller. Whether you have a whiteboard, sticky notes, the back of a napkin, pieces of paper, whatever. I've seen people use all kinds of crazy things. You're going to want to take notes. First, I'm going to start off a little bit here and tell you a little bit about some of the cool things we've done. I started us off with a nice little video, if you will, of just some of the people that we've worked with. In fact, this is a little bit of an overview of some of the 156 people that were part of the first year that we did this, and then a few others added in over the course of the years. I've worked now with about four, almost 5,000 people, helping them write, publish, and market their books to bestseller. The coolest part about that, though, is, is that that several thousand people equates to several million people whose lives have been touched, and I hope changed, by the messages of those incredible authors I've gotten to work with. Um, we're going to cover a little bit about who we are and what we do some benefits of being a best-selling author. And then, as I said, we're going to jump right into our best-seller formula. I kind of told you a little bit about me, uh, my books, and uh, all the folks that I've wor worked with. But I don't want to just help you today to write a book. I want to help you write a best-seller. Keep that word in mind. You're going to hear it a couple of times. Because someone is waiting on you. You have a story that you can tell. You have a solution that you know. You know, people come to you for answers. Most of them are probably trying to take your answers from you for free. Maybe you need, in fact, I know you do need to write a book to share the message of who you are right now, where you are with the world mm -hmm. and make the difference that only you can make as you live and thrive and be all that you are in this world today. What are the benefits of being a best-selling author? Well, there is, of course, speaking. Um, I can tell you from experience as a marketing professional who's been in marketing space for more than 30 years now that it's the number one marketing credential that you can get bar none. In fact, I have medical doctors that I've worked with that are would be the first ones to tell you that they get more out of being a best-selling author than they have in being a professional in their field as a doctor for over 20 years. It is the number one thing you can do to be able to maximize the marketing of anything that you do. Just going to talk real quickly, real briefly about a few of the people that I've worked with. Uh, Forrest Follin and Anthony Steele, who had a really powerful company before I ever met them, they used their book to create a whole new division of their business. And from that, they made over $200,000 in the first year of that business. And then there's Pastor Andrea Humphrey, who um, had several books before that. And what she found was not only did she become a bestseller, she was number 84 out of all bestselling books in the entire of Amazon. All of the books on Amazon, she was number 84 out of all of them. The coolest part about all that, though, was that her books that she had written before, they started selling too. 
people that didn't even know she had books now not only knew about her, but knew about her bestsellers. Some of you, if you're from England or in those areas, you may have heard of Stuart Ross. I'm told he is essentially the Tony Robbins of, of England. Um, and the one thing of all the stuff he had done in the world that he hadn't done was he wasn't a bestseller. So what did we do? We came in and we helped him become a number one bestselling author with his book, Growth Hacks. And then there's Dr. Alicia Griffith. I alluded to her a little earlier. Her quote is directly that she gets more out of being a best-selling author than the credentials behind her name. She was on television as a featured uh, author within 30 days of her book coming out. She's done a national book tour, and she's also been on both Good Morning America and the Today Show since then. And then there's my good friend, Carl Michelle. Carl Michelle's book, if you looked it up right now, 365 Hip Hop, you would very likely find that it is in the top 10. It's a bestseller. This book came out January 1st. Well, it was marketed January 1st, 2016, and has been on the bestseller list now for, what is that, seven and a half years? Um, that's pretty cool. He's gotten endorsements from Lauren Hill, Common, Jadakiss, 50 Cent, Charlemagne the God, so many other cool things that he's been able to do with his book. In fact, Carl will be the first one to tell you, I cannot be referred to anymore just as Carl Michelle. I'm the number one international bestselling author, Carl Michelle. Carl, before he put his book out, he couldn't get people to return his calls for speaking gigs for free. After having his book out within three months, he was booked up to six months in advance at $2,000 per speaking gig, all on the back of his best-selling book. But remember, we don't just write books. We write, that's right, best sellers. And it's a formula. It's not magic. Um, I am very sorry. I don't want to be like the person who told you that your mom and dad put the Christmas presents under the tree um, and that there was no Santa Claus. But there is a formula to success and to making a book a bestseller. And we know that formula. We've done it thousands upon thousands of times. In fact, we guarantee it. I have 100% success rate on all those thousands I've worked with. It's based off of what consumers want, something that's easy to read, systematic, and it's predictable. I can guarantee you, you will be a bestseller. So what kind of book should you write? Well, I can tell you, Amazon would be the ones to tell you as well. Short reads are hot. A short read is technically a book of 100 pages or less. Therefore, everybody, you know, just like you, who are busy, who want information but don't have a lot of time. The book can be consumed faster. It can be reviewed faster. Um, and they typically get more five-star reviews because people see them and can know and really remember how much they liked them because they go through them so quickly. In fact, Amazon did some research because they love doing that. And if your book is 100 pages or less, more than 60% of the people to get the book, we'll finish it. However, if your book goes from 101 to 200 pages, only about 20% of the people are going to finish the book. Now, here's the shocking part. If your book is more than 200 pages, less than 3% of the people that get the book will ever finish reading it. Now, all of us know that at the end of the book is both the conclusion as well as the next steps in a business book with us. What are we going to do if less than 3% of readers ever finish our book? We need them to read it, to finish it, to take the next steps with us. Give you an idea of some people who are using short reads powerfully. John Maxwell, who has more than 100 books to his name, all of which prior to discovering short reads were 300 plus page books. He now has learned the secret of taking what would have been a chapter in his book and turning it into the whole book. Now his followers refer to it as the purple book or the green book or the blue book. And he takes the one concept, the thinking, and I want you to be, maybe even write this down, is we want to take one point, we want to make it really clear, 
And we want to give the people a clear action off of that one point. And if there's a second point, guess what? That means that there is a second book. Some of you have heard of Seth Godin. For those of you who haven't, Seth Godin, going way back to the early days of Yahoo, was the marketing director for Yahoo, and he is one of the absolute digital marketing gurus in the world. He has five books that are less than 100 pages. All of his books are technically under 150 pages and considered short reads. V is for Vulnerable is even only 64 pages. I was in a meeting with Seth Godin, and he said something so powerful, and that was this. I may not need a plumber right now, but if I need a plumber, I want to write, I want to read the information and hire the guy who is the best selling author. That is so, so powerful. And I think it's something you, we need to keep in mind with our businesses as well. And then many of you have heard of Brene Brown, her book, Gifts of Imperfection, which is technically 160 pages. But if you've got it, open it up and look at it again. It's a number one New York Times bestseller. It's an Amazon bestseller. But it has one inch margins all the way around. Very, very wide. They might even be wider than one inch. Um, and each of the chapters start halfway down the page. There's a lot of really interesting things they did formatting to make the book, quote unquote, long enough. And then lastly, Who Moved My Cheese? Any of you that have worked in corporate have probably read this book, and you were probably delighted when you looked it up and saw that it was only 95 pages in large print and that you could get through it very quickly. 44 different languages, more than 28 million copies sold worldwide. Very, very powerful little 95-page book. And if you're thinking, well, maybe I need to think about that, but I don't even know if I could do that big of a book, let me introduce you to marketing in less than a thousand words. That's right. Six pages. It's a number one bestseller. It's 999 words exactly. And I promise you, even as a marketing professional for all the years I've been doing it, this book will teach you some really great tips and tricks on marketing. It is an amazingly powerful book. So what are we going to write? Let's begin to think about this a little bit. What do you want to be known for? What programs are you going to be focused on for the rest of this year or for the next six months or 12 months? Maybe even easier, if you sat down next to your absolute ideal client in the airport. You were talking, you got to know each other. You only have about five minutes to tell them what is the one thing you want to make sure that they know? The one thing you want to cover with them more than anything else. So with that said, time to grab your paper. In the middle of the paper, I want you to make a great big circle in the middle. This is our bullseye. There's an old saying that says, if you aim at nothing, you'll probably hit it. <laughs> um, so if you don't aim at anything, well, <laughs> so let's create a bullseye. We can always change it. We can always pivot, but we need to know where we're beginning, what we're thinking. Um, if you have a working title, that's, of course, awesome. If you don't have a working title, then... Just go with a topic I want to talk about. You know, in that five minutes, I would tell this person about. Now, the good news is, is this paper is only for you. I promise I won't make you turn it in and grade it or anything. You just simply need to be able to read and understand what it is. So you can make shorthand notes to yourself. You know, you can say things like, about the time when. And as long as you remember the time when, that's all that matters. So in the middle of that circle, write down your target, your title, or your topic. All right? And then from out from the circle, let's draw four lines, north, south, east, and west, or up, down, right, and left, whichever way you want to look at that. All right? And we are going to start on the line that's going to the right, the line that's pointing east, okay? We want to talk about the who and why. You see, people don't buy from people that they don't know. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. 
we buy from people that we know, like, and trust. I know I just assailed you with, with a ton of quotes, but all of them are very true. And section one is about who you are and how you discovered exactly what you're going to teach them. We follow a little format to be able to make this work. It's simply this. This is who I am today, but it wasn't always that way. And this is what I've learned. We need them to know us, like us, and trust us, to believe in us so that they're bought in. Now, some of you, if you happen to be writing fiction books, this is where we have to create from the beginning an engaging, compelling character. If right from the very moment that the book starts, we're not curious or even possibly in love with the character, we can't possibly be able to get the reader to want to go on to page two, let alone to read all the rest of the pages. We might say something like, she looked with trepidation, fear showing to everyone in her eyes, but she stood staunchly and began the process of moving forward in her life. Now, don't you want to know who she is and what she's doing? That was just off at the top of my head. I didn't steal that from one of my books. <laughs> Anyway, we want to, in section one, talk about this is my life now, but it wasn't always this way. And that's how I discovered this. So draw for yourself three little lines off of the bottom of that line and put in the best now. So when we're talking about now, we're talking about um, showing a vision to the reader of what life can look like when they too do this thing that you've discovered and that you do with grace and ease. Does that make sense? So, you know, before I discovered this thing, I struggled with, um, but now that I'm, so we're not going to go into that quite yet. Right. We, right now, what we want to do is we want to show them now that I know this thing, now my life is more fulfilling. I, I love more. I know more. Um, so that's the best now. And then we want to dive in. We want to use something. I want you to put these in the back of your head and remember them forever. We want to be vulnerable and valuable. It's in our vulnerability that we connect one to another. It's that ability to be able to say and mean, I know what you're going through. I've been there myself. I get it. I understand. And maybe you're a couple of steps down the road from where your reader is, and that's even better. Maybe you can show them where the rocks that you missed when you fell off into the swamp, where they are, and maybe they can miss out on some of the things you went through. But we need to be vulnerable to them. It's in our vulnerability that we connect. It's in our vulnerability that people understand they're not alone. And then after we've shared with them what we went through, we can share with them the amazing discovery of what we learned. This is what I learned. This is how I learned it. This is this cool thing that allows me to now live that life that I started off this section talking to you about. It's important that I note now, we're talking about the four sections of a book. These aren't necessarily four chapters. This section could be one chapter. It could be 10. It doesn't really matter at this point how many chapters you're writing. It's just about putting together the format in the sections that all books are. You, If you've never listened to me do this before, now every time you read a book, you're going to start seeing the magic of yeah. the fact that this is in all the books. There's a few exceptions, but in most all books out there, this is the four steps that we do to tell a story, to write a book. So now let's move on to section two. Section two is the line going down, the line going south, however you want to say that. Okay. And section two is about what does this solve? This is our teaching part. Um, I always tell people when I'm helping people learn speaking, tell the person what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. So we want to take a thing. Remember before I said, take one point, make it really clear and give them a clear action from that one point. Well, that's what we want to do. We want to give them a clear, followable, actionable thing that they can do. Now, there may be steps, 
Um, if we were teaching them something, there may be three or four or five steps to be able to do that one thing. And that's okay, but we can only do one thing. Um, any of you that have ever read the book Profit First by Mike McCallowitz, love that book. If you haven't read it, uh, get it in audio. Mike is hilarious. He is so much fun to listen to in audio. But he has a section in his book uh, right towards the beginning, really, where he says, before you move on, go and do this thing and then come back to the book. Well, none of us did that. We all continued reading the or listening to the audio. Um, and the problem that our reader has is if there are, say, 10 steps to do this one thing, we get all the way to number 10. We're excited because number 10 is always exciting. It's got outcome. It's got results. It's it's sexy. It's fulfilling. And so we just immediately jump to doing number 10. Well, here's the problem. We didn't do one through nine, and then number 10 doesn't work. And then we're mad at the author because what they said wasn't true. It's a bunch of hooey. <laughs> Instead of realizing that we need steps one through nine in order for step 10 to really actually work. So what we need to do is we need to just give them a book that is step one and then invite them to take the next step with us. I tell this joke all the time, and I think it's only me, maybe a few other people that are my age, but only me that really even understands or appreciates this. But as they taught the winter warlock, in uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town way back in the 60s, for those of you that remember that cartoon, we've got to put one foot in front of the other and soon we'll be walking across the floor. Lonnie's rolling her eyes at me now oh, for that. No. <laughs> but it's true. Reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> that is how we learn things. We take one step at a time. Even when we're jumping, we only jump one jump at a time. Even if we move both feet, we're still only taking just one step. We want to give that to our people so that they can know how to make more money or have greater joy or deeper meaning in their life. We want to help them solve the problem that is the reason why we're writing this book. So we're going to do the three lines off of that and jot down some notes to ourselves of what and some stories that we can tell. Uh, this is what I'm going to tell you and then tell you, and then tell you what I told you. Okay, so that's section two. We're gonna move on now to section three. This one is a lot of fun and sometimes scary for us a little bit because this is the takeaway, this is the downside. This is the, well, what if I don't do it? Okay. You see, we have to empower people when they're reading our books and we're giving them something, something, especially something transformational. We need to empower them with the ability to choose, even if what they choose is to not do it. And that can be really hard for us. It can be very frustrating. You know what it's like when you tell somebody exactly what to do, and then they come back to you three months, six months, two years later, and they're struggling with the same exact thing. And the answer that you have for them is the same exact thing as it was two years ago. So what we want to do in this section is we want to help them see this is what you've been going through. And this is what you'll continue to go through if you don't make this change. And then empower them with the ability to choose to change, to know that they can, and then to do it. What are some of the downsides? Less money, more stress. Your business that is failing completely fails. You stay stuck in this continued pattern. There's also some great things you can think of, and I even encourage you to write these down. If I could go back to the younger version of myself, you know, before the transition that we wrote about in section one, what advice would I give me? Now, I love it because every once in a while, I'll run into somebody and they're like, my life's perfect, or my life turned out exactly the way that it did because of all the decisions I made. That's absolutely true. And I'm glad that you are exactly who you are right now. But let's be real. All of us can think back at whether it's our teen years or our young adult years or last week um, and think of how we would have done that thing differently. It doesn't have to be, you know, earth shattering, changing. I've often said when remodeling a house, Everybody should get a tester house first to learn and make all the mistakes 
so that then when they go to actually remodel their house, they can do it the way that they know now they should have done it. Because if you don't, and I can tell you from experience, if you don't, you'll end up sitting up in the middle of the night when you can't sleep, looking at that wall and realizing that if you would have just done X, Y, Z differently, it would have been exactly what you wish it was now. Of course, you're not going to just blow out that whole one wall just to make that change. But that's the kind of stuff that we would advise the younger version of ourselves. Sometimes we have people come to us and they say, hey, I wish I would have met you last week, last month, last year. I wish I would have known what I know now because I wouldn't have done what I did. It can be some of the toughest conversations we have when we're coaching somebody, when we have to explain to them that the money that they just spent, um, well, they shouldn't have spent it. They wasted it. It's not going to do them any good. It didn't help them. Or sometimes we have people come to us and they tell us about all the money they spent with other people and they still don't have the result they wanted. And of course they're feeling, oh, I wish I would have met you sooner. This is the kind of things we can put in here so that we can tell them the, the stories of the people. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I haven't actually charged anybody for this thing that I want to write in this book. And that's okay. You've been practicing it, maybe on friends, maybe on family, definitely on yourself. You've been encouraging, succeeding, failing, going back and forth through it with yourself for years. And you can tell the stories, even if all the stories are just the story of you. What is the downside to doing this? What are the things that they will be stuck in? And what are the things they can change? This is also what we call in three-act plays the second act. This is, in movies, the downturn. You know, Luke Skywalker and Han Solo are stuck in the trash compactor. And the droids are outside of the door, trying desperately to get it opened in time. And they hear the screams, and our hearts sink because now our heroes are dead. <laughs> and C-3PO says, oh, my master, I've killed my master. Now, that's not the end of Star Wars. I'm very sorry if those of you who have never seen Star Wars, um, you kind of can't spoiler alert a movie that was from 1976, but um, it's a cool movie even still. But that is what a section three is in a nonfiction book. And it can also be a real intense takeaway buildup kind of moment, even in our nonfictions. So that's what we're going to do in our three lines off of our line going to the left. And that's why I wish I did it sooner. Things that are bad currently, results that you could have had. I wish I would have met you sooner. Stories from the people that are in your life that you've helped, even yourself. All right, let's move on to section four. Section four is what are the key things that they can do right now today? Section four breaks up into two different parts. We have the immediate action that they themselves can do, that if they never work with you, this is the thing that they can do. They can set the book down and go and do it right now. We also have additionally to that, we have the things that they should do, can do the next step with you. After reading this book, I have this course, this next book, this discussion, this coaching program, this whatever that is the next step beyond this book. And we can invite them to that. So we have both of those. So first of all, let's talk about the right now actionable steps. Um, let's say that our book was a teaching on why hydration is so important. Why is it important to stay hydrated? How powerful is hydration? I did a cool interview with a lady, it's been about a year ago now, and she was talking about the effect that dehydration actually literally has on your brain, about the brain damage that actually occurs when we're even just mildly dehydrated, and how important to the functioning of our brain staying hydrated is. It's a very cool interview. Um, I don't remember the lady's name. You'd have to go back and dig through some past episodes of my show to, to hear it. But uh, very, very cool stuff. 
Um, and her whole teaching is on why you need to hydrate, why water is so important, why it should be the primary thing you drink. That would be her book. In that, there could be an immediate action. And I use this example a lot. I think it's a very good example for people. If you need to begin the process of drinking more water, of staying more hydrated, the first thing you need to do is you need to go get a drink of water right now. Now, here's the reality of the steps of that. Okay, first of all, we have to do the most difficult of all things. We have to turn away from our computer. That's right. We can't one more thing ourselves. We can't answer one more email. We need to set the book down, go walk to the kit, go walk to the kitchen, get a glass out, fill it up with water, then don't bring it back to your desk and set it down next to you, you know, like this bottle of water sitting next to me is right now. But actually drink some of the water then. And then also bring a full glass of water back to have with you while you're working and learn to sip on water all the time. That might be all the steps. It could even include the very specifics of, you know, after we've turned around from the computer, we got to do the difficult step of standing up, getting up out of the chair and not letting ourselves get caught by that message that just came in that causes us to turn back around after we turned away from the computer. So our steps can be like that. Now we want to keep it simple for the folks. I suggest that you have one to five steps. That's what I mean by the tips. One to five tips to help them with that one thing. Okay. When we give people multiple things that they can do, well, you could journal or you could do yoga every day, or you could do this, especially if we say it, or you could, um, it leaves people in confusion and then they don't take action. We want to give them a strong, powerful action and the steps to be able to do it right now. Set the book down, turn away from the computer, stand up, walk across the room, get the glass out of the cupboard, fill it with water, drink the water right now, refill the cup, bring it back, set it on the desk, someplace where you're sure to see it, but not where you'll knock it over and, and ruin your computer, <laughs> and drink water on a regular basis throughout your day. So those are simple, easy, actionable steps on the very large whole thing that she teaches about water. And we could do that on, on anything that your book's about. Then, we, so that's our immediate actionable thing. Then we have the what's the next step with us. Um, and it might be something that has to do with our health and wellness. Maybe it's in this case, maybe it's a group where we all hold each other accountable for how are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe if we're trying to lose weight, there's nothing like an accountability buddy if you've decided that you're going to be serious about losing weight because, you know, you can lie to yourself. You can track your points or your calories or, you know, your exercise or all that. You can track it for yourself. And if it's not true, you know, you're cheating yourself. Absolutely. But nobody's going to look over your shoulder and know. But when you have an accountability partner, oh my gosh you're going to feel really bad, first of all, if you're lying to them, and you usually can't. But secondly, you know you're going to be on the phone with them or you're going to be in the message room with them or whatever, and you're going to have to tell them, I blew it. I ate a whole entire pizza today. I only meant to have one slice, but before I knew it, it was all gone. Or, you know, whatever it might be. I was going to walk 10,000 steps today, but I only walked 2,000 because I just felt lazy today and I didn't want to do it. It's okay to be real. So those are the kind of courses, groups, programs, things that for whatever you're doing, we can create for our people so that they can know exactly what the next step with you is. We're going to give them the action steps and the little breakdown of the one, two, three. Three steps is even better than having five, you know, if, if there's five things to do, um, having three things of get up go get the water and drink it now is easier than the get up, you know, turn away from your computer, get up, walk across the room, open the door, you know, obviously, right. You know I mean? It becomes a little redundant at that point. So those three basic steps, most people can 
can kind of fill in the blanks between there. Um, and, and we found out from research that actually when we give a person more than three things to do, more than three choices, they tend to lock up and not do any of them. So now we've got our paper. We've got our four lines with three lines going off of them. We've got all kinds of powerful information. And it, it may look like chicken scratches to you, but that's okay. As long as you can read it. Now we want to kind of overview a little bit. What was each section? Section one, again, we talked about who we are and how we discovered this thing. This is who I am today, but it wasn't always this way. And this is what I learned. In section two, it's our, it's our solution. It's our teaching. It's what does this solve? Why should you do this? And how do you do this even more than just the why? Section three is what is the downside if they don't do it? Okay, you don't do it. This is what life's going to look like. This is what I would tell the younger version of me if I could go back and tell me why I should have done this sooner. And then section four is what can you do right now today? What can you do on your own? And what are the next steps to come and work with me? All right. Now, last but not least, we want to talk about stories. Our whole book typically isn't just stories, but stories fill in the blanks. When I use even quirky, funny things like, uh, you know, put one foot in front of the other with the winter warlock, and it makes Lonnie look at me and go, oh, man, um, they're memorable, even if memorable in a bad way. Um, <laughs> when we tell the stories of, of our children and our life and the things we went through, that emphasizes the point. So it's not about the whole book being about us, but it is about the stories of us and the people that we've worked with that make it the most powerful. It helps relate it. It helps allow people. And it allows you, again, to be vulnerable and valuable for them. So what I'd like for you to do is in each of the sections, in the corners, write just a note to yourself of an additional story or two for each of those sections that you can tell your own story, a story of a client, story of a friend or a family member. Again, it doesn't have to be somebody that paid you for it to be a powerful story of change that somebody made in their life. So jot down those stories and congratulations. You've just written the rough draft of your book. Yep. I told you we were going to write your bestseller in an hour. Guess what? 42 minutes, actually. <laughs> you just wrote your book. <laughs> Now, some of you are saying, well, yeah, but it's not a completely done book. All right, I get that. Let me teach you some tricks to make the rest of it easier. First of all, I'm going to strongly encourage you to use the power of speaking to write. Doing something like, you know, we're here on Zoom today, so I can use Zoom as an example. Turning on Zoom, uh, putting a picture of your ideal client right in front of you, and just recording yourself speaking out teaching that person with all the love in your heart, share with them what you know and how you do. Have the notes that you've made in front of you and go through them. Um, even better yet, if you can get somebody, you know, like myself or others that are really great at doing interviews and have them interview you, walk you through the questions and say, tell me more about who you are today. Tell me more about how I do that thing so that I really can. Why is it that water is so powerful to my brain? Again, it allows us to be vulnerable and authentic. It makes it a con conversational style of writing versus something that's robotic or textbook style. And for sure, it's your words. It's your phrases. And then you want to employ somebody like Lonnie who is a story development editor, who can come through all of that, kind of arrange all of your talking, and also tell you where are the holes in what you've said. You see, you told us the story about Aunt Jan, but then you never finished telling us, what happened to Aunt Jan? I gotta know what's up with Aunt Jan. It's like if I were to tell you right now the story about how we went through um, with my youngest daughter when she had acute myeloid leukemia and was in the hospital for six months. Now, if I just stop right there, the rest of you are going to stop listening to the rest of this time. And you're going to be wondering what's wrong with poor Maya and is she okay now? 
Well, let me skip ahead and tell you, she's doing wonderfully. She's more than six years in remission. In fact, the doctors call that quote unquote cured. She's married, has a wonderful life. She's doing very well. It was a very difficult time in our life, but it's a very, very cool ending to the story. You see, we want to know the end of what happened and not just get left with a bombshell that leaves us feeling bad, right? So what are you going to do with your book? What are you going to use it for? I mean, yes, you could just sell books one at a time. It's one of the hardest ways I can think to make significant money is if you're trying to make the money, you know, a dollar or two, which is what you're going to make off of your book at a time. But maybe you're going to sell massive uh, quantities of it to uh, organizations. I've worked with people who create um, devotionals along with the workbooks that go with it, and they sell it to whole church organizations. So they'll sell them 50 or 100 copies of it. Um, of course, I work with a lot of coaches, and they'll, they're in, on purpose, like Dr. Dreon Birch, who created a course for doctors to teach them how to be business people, and sold, get this, over $160,000 of um, people that joined the course in the first 60 days after his book came out, because he was intentional about it. He intentionally wanted to have a book that would drive them to want to be part of of his course and join that. And that worked. Maybe you want to get more speaking gigs. I can tell you, I've had my radio show for eight and a half years now. Um, and everyone that has their own podcast or their own radio show will tell you that it is so powerful when you look at somebody's speaker one sheet and you see they're not just a person with a great idea. They're a bestseller. They're the best selling author on the book. Seth Godin, I'll go back to him again. He said, if you're writing your book to make money, then don't. But if you want to make money, you absolutely have to have a book. And that's very powerful. As I said earlier, your book is the foundational, powerful, most mandatory way of maximizing any marketing that you do is when you just tag it with the, this is based on my best-selling book or this is taught by the best-selling author of the book, right. blah, blah, blah. So powerful. In fact, over 50% of all movies that get made are based off of bestsellers. Next time you see a trailer and it says, based off the critically acclaimed or based off of the best-selling book by, you'll be like, I see it now, Steve. There are a ton of books out there like that. So what are you going to do with the book? Because someone is waiting on you. In the end, all that we have in us is good for who we are in the world, but it's meant only as good as we can give it away. When we help others, when we share who we are with somebody else, we make the world a better place. There's somebody who's making a bad decision right now. They may even be on Google, desperate and in tears, looking for the answer that you do. In fact, it may be so easy that you discounted it and you didn't even think to make the book that we just wrote about that thing. They're crying because they don't know how to do it and they want to so badly, but they don't know it because you haven't told them. You see, here's the thing. You can say, yeah, but what I talk about is something that everybody talks about, everybody knows. Well, number one, that's not true. There are people who struggle with it regardless but number two is they haven't heard you say it. It's like for those of us that have been parents, um, it's like when you tell your child the same thing over and over and over again. And then one day they come home from school and they're like, guess what I learned? Mrs. So-and-so said, and they tell you the same exact thing that you've been saying to them for years. And you want to look at them and say, duh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't of course because you don't want to stymie their learning but you know in your heart you're kind of feeling that a little bit <laughs> and that's true for all of us the way someone will say it the timbre of their voice the way they use their words will come through to you in the way that it was meant to that only you can share it for the person that you're meant to reach in fact i'm going to help you out your book is going to reach millions. 
that's going to change and affect the world. But I want you to not worry about all the hundreds of thousands of millions of people your book's going to help. And just focus on one. If you helped even just one person, that would be more than enough. Now, whether your book is 10 years old or you haven't even started it, I can help. We're here for you. We really, truly can get you from where you are to a finished, done, completed bestseller. <laughs> Sorry, I had to, use, had to use that whisper thing. I've been thinking about that for, for weeks now. Anyway, yes, to be a best-selling author. It is the ultimate marketing tool of a lifetime. That's why I wrote that book and made it a bestseller. So no matter how old your book is, I've actually worked with folks whose books are over 20 years old. I worked with one lady who has never touched a computer, doesn't own one, hasn't ever seen one. Well, I mean, I'm sure she's just seen them, but she's never used one. And we took and made her book a bestseller that was written out on yellow pages. And we had to, uh, you know, type them all out for her and everything. We have a solution for you. In fact, as Lonnie alluded to, if you want to dip your toe into it just a little bit, you could just start by writing a chapter in our un upcoming anthology book yeah. that wants you to ask, answer just this simple question. What, over the course of the last five years, what significant thing has happened that's changed your perspective on something? I asked my best friend, Craig, that the, last night, actually. And he was like, well, for me, honestly, he goes, I'd need a little longer than five years because the big one that immediately jumps out of my mind is happened 11 years ago. And he talked about the significant event of the change that happened in their life 11 years ago. And that's his story to tell. Um, and, and I'm getting him slowly to a point where he's safe and comfortable enough to tell it because it was a very heart-wrenching thing. And there's some really cool things that have come from the most difficult moment of his life. So it doesn't have to be just the last five years. And I told him that too. But we've been through a lot in the last five years. It's been a really strange world the last five years. And I know there are a lot of you that have stories. So if you're not quite ready to be able to go out and write a whole book, let's at least put a chapter out. You can go to writeyourbestsellerworkshop.com. That'll take you right straight to the page to jump in. It's so super cheap. It's at less than 25% of what I normally would charge for that class because we want to help some people bring their stuff out into the world. We want you to be our next best-selling author in that anthology book and to share what you know with the world. We have programs that are done for you, done with you. I have the taught to you courses, like the one I'm talking about. We also can market you if you have a book that's already done. It's just simply a matter of where are you and what do you need in order to complete your book? So we're inviting you to be part of this anthology book, whether you've got 20 books that you've done or you've never even thought about writing until just now, come join us. Go to writeyourbestsellerworkshop.com, sign up. There's even a cool bonus that you can get in on if you want to. We'd love to have you part of that anthology. It's filling up fast. In fact, we're probably going to end up being in a place where we have two or three of them that we're writing in the course of that first weekend. Over the course of three-day weekend, we're going to do the whole thing. You will be done. You'll go two, two hours on the evening of Friday and four hours Saturday and Sunday, and you'll be done. You'll have everything you need. Your chapter will be written, and we'll take all the rest of it from there. And then we'll come back to you and have you get to celebrate and be part of the launch of the book. That's some really cool stuff that we've got there. Because remember, someone is waiting on you. And you're going to be a bestseller. We guarantee it. I've done it thousands upon thousands of times with 100% success rate. In fact, if after all we've talked about, you've still got questions, you're like, well, I don't know, Steve, 
Not sure if I believe you. Let's get on a call and let's talk. Let me give you a free 15 minutes of my time to talk about anything I can do to help you with any aspect of your book, your life, your business. I'm here for you. If you just go to asksteveKid.com, that'll take you straight to my uh, calendar. You can book a time. I've even got time still available today. And yes, I'm even available tomorrow. I know, crazy me, I work seven days a week because I love what I do and I love sharing you with the world. For most of you though, you know you're ready. You know you at least need to be part of this anthology. You probably need to do your whole own book too. And we could talk about how you can do both of those. But go to writeyourbestsellerworkshop.com right now and let's make you our next bestseller. We guarantee it. All right, so now that we've written your book, and now that we've talked about all the ways that you can write your bestseller, we've talked about Write Your Bestseller Workshop. Let's open the floor up for questions. You're going to have to unmute yourself in most cases if you want to ask questions, or you can type it in the chat. I've got both of those open, and we will uh, we will gladly do it. Um, I'm going to put, or Lonnie, if you can type in the chat, if you can type writeyourbestsellerworkshop.com, and then I will turn off the share screen. And the recording probably for their questions. Oh, yeah. So if you have questions and you're listening to the recording, go to asksteveKid.com and schedule with me right now, or just go to writeyourbestsellerworkshop.com and sign up. But for those of you who are listening on the recording, this is the end. Thanks for joining us. The rest of you stick around, ask your questions.